These are much longer than the others. And they are round too. Cool, but strange. There are cracks in all the rocks. Look, this one looks different from the rest. There's very small cracks everywhere. Totally crumbly. Why do you think that is? Hmm, strange. I don't know. Shall we keep looking? Yes. Really? Yes. They look different from all the other rocks. Look, they're red. Yuck. Looks like blood. Look. This looks really terrible. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah, let's go. Astounding what the children have found. Hercule Poirot must get going. It looks to me like a crime against rocks. As a detective, I start with the basic observations. Many rocks have been murdered. The questions follow, how were they murdered? Where were they murdered? And who is the murderer? This reminds me of the puzzle on the Orient Express. To say. There's rocks everywhere here, but no people. In this case, I'm going to need expert advice. He finds the experts at a research institute for geosciences. Back there in the hall, rocks have been found. I suspect they have been murdered. The key that will help you answer your question can be found in Chile. This quarry is in South America, in the coastal mountains of Chile. At the top, we see the thin layer of soil, the skin of the earth. The rock beneath it looks just like granite, but instead it's very soft and fragile. The granite is weathered down to a depth of 20 meters. What has happened here? A German-Chilean research project is investigating this question. The project is called Deep Earth Shape, how processes happening deep below ground shape the Earth's surface. Deep Earth shape came about because we realized that the change of the Earth's surface, and specifically the conversion of rock into soil, takes place much, much deeper than we actually expected. That's why we are now drilling down to 100 meters to locate the deep boundary between unweathered rock and weathered rock and soil. In Chile, drilling takes place at four locations. They differ in the amount of rainfall they receive, and therefore the plant cover is also very different. From Panda Azúcar, in the north within one of the driest places on Earth, the Atacama Desert. Almost no plants grow in this arid climate. Via Santa Gracia, in a semi-arid climate and without much vegetation, just a few cacti and shrubs. And La Campana. The area has a Mediterranean climate with considerable rainfall and a dense vegetation of trees and shrubs. And finally, to Nahuel Buta in the south. 
This is a rainforest with lots of rainfall. Oracaria trees grow here, trees that date back to the Jurassic period. At these four sites, we want to find out how rocks weather and how they are converted into soil. To do this, we have to drill up to 100 meters deep. We suspect that life at the surface plays a key role in this. If there are many plants at the surface, there will also be a large number of microbes and reagents in the soil. To what depth do they reach? In order to find out what role climate and life play in the subsurface, we are drilling at four locations in Chile, with very different climatic conditions and vegetation covers. I am the Chilean representative of the German team that has come to investigate who is responsible for the murder of the rocks. To do this, they have to drill holes to find out what happened in the subsurface. Drilling rock at great depths is difficult and requires heavy equipment. With the help of this rig, rock samples can be brought to the surface in metal pipes. These drill rods are bolted together one after the other to reach the desired depth. The drill head is placed onto the lowest rod. Because the rock is very hard, the drill head is fitted with small but incredibly tough diamonds. When the drill head eats its way down into the depths, it gets very hot. To cool it, water is pumped down into the borehole through the rods. A lot of water. Depending on how tough the rock is, the drill head can cut its way down at a rate of one to two meters per hour. We want to examine the rock cores to see if they contain microbes, for example, bacteria or fungi. To do this, the rocks should be totally uncontaminated by microbes from the drilling water. We have to continuously sample the drilling water to find and exclude possible sources of contamination. It gets really exciting when the drillers have pulled a new drill core, a one and a half meter long rock core that emerges from the depths in the drill rod. This drill core is released from the steel rod with the help of some water pressure. Now the subsurface begins to offer up its mysteries for the geologists, like a story unfolding in a book. Each drill core represents a new chapter, each time with a surprise. You never know what will happen in the next chapter. Then the researchers carry the core to the field station, housed in this container. The work on the rock cores begins immediately. The cores are unpacked and marked so that the top and bottom can never be confused. The red line on the right-hand side indicates that here is up and here is down. This avoids any confusion that might arise from using arrows. Samples for the laboratory are taken under sterile conditions. They are sawn and hammered from the cores. A photo station is set up for photographic documentation. This setup isn't available in the shops, so our team must build it themselves. The cores are photographed, and documented by drawings, then archived. 
This requires a lot of organisation. But let's get back to the murder mystery. How did the murder that weathered the rocks actually take place? Many of the rock cores are broken. So our first suspect is fractures. Why do rocks break? Weathering needs fractures in the rock. When two tectonic plates collide, like the Nazca Plate of the Pacific Ocean and the South American continent, as shown here, a mountain range is formed. In a 40 km deep cross-section through this mountain range, we see that fractures are created by the movement of the plates, and that the fractures have different directions. Zooming in, a 100 m cross-section of this fracture zone shows that it actually consists of many fractures. Every time the plates slide against each other, there is an earthquake, and new fractures are created. A 10 mm piece of the rock seen under the microscope reveals quite a few tiny cracks. Sometimes they even split individual crystals. These microfractures can also be caused by the movement of the rocks against each other, but also when erosion at the Earth's surface removes the burden of the overlying rock. The second suspect is water, but there's a problem. Once the drill cores appear in the open air, all the water is gone. Even deep below the surface, it doesn't flow all the time but water changes rocks. The crime committed against the rocks is caused by weathering. I study weathering processes at the Earth's surface and also processes that happen at greater depths. I look in particular at what happens deep below the ground at hydrothermal processes. We use so-called reactive transport models. These are computer programs with which we simulate what happens when a fluid flows through porous material. In this case, the fluid can come from rain or it can be hydrothermal and the porous material is the rock. Weathering of rock needs water. Here we see a package of rock fractured by tectonic movement. If this rock is gradually eroded from above, it moves closer towards the Earth's surface. There it is exposed to precipitation and water begins to penetrate the soil and the layers beneath the soil. Through the tectonic fractures, the water can reach great depths. This is a rapid transport process. However, the water can attack the rock only along the surfaces of the fractures. So how does the water penetrate into the rock itself? A microscopic image of the rock at a millimetre scale shows how. The water slowly moves into the interior along the smallest cracks that occur here. This is a slow transport process. The third suspect is the reagents. Acids, organic carbon and other compounds that are contained in the water. You can see reddish minerals in this withered area. This is an indication that we have iron oxidation on the surface of these fractures. This alteration needs reagents. Where do they come from? Plants and microorganisms produce CO2, and this is a very important reagent for weathering. We have the hypothesis that the carbon contained in this CO2 is very young. It was only introduced recently into the ecosystem, where it essentially drives the cycling of all other elements. To weather rock, reagents are required, especially those that contain carbon, shown in yellow. For example, small amounts of CO2 are found in rainwater as carbonic acid. In much larger quantities, CO2 is produced by plant roots and by microbes. Thus, CO2, carbonic acid and organic carbon accumulate in the top layer of soil. Through the large fractures, they reach great depth, dissolved in water. A 10 mm microscope image of the rock shows how the many small yellow dots, the carbon, flow through the fine fractures. Zooming in even closer, we see how the carbon and water dissolve minerals, like the feldspar. Thus, the pores in the rock get progressively larger. The water in the pores becomes gradually enriched in rock-forming elements, for example silicon, that are dissolved from the mineral. 
soon the solution cannot hold any more silicon. The silicon precipitates and new, completely different minerals form, for example, clay minerals. These, however, take up more space. This creates fine fractures through which water with carbon can penetrate further and the weathering begins again. What I'm interested in is iron oxidation and iron reduction, which you can see here. Mostly it has brownish discolorations at the surface. I want to find out what organisms are responsible for this oxidation, how deep they can be found, what kind of distribution they have, and finally be able to draw conclusions what these microbes are doing down there. This spider is not the murderer. So the fourth suspect is the microbes that need minerals and live on the mineral surfaces. So we think that the deeper that we go, the more important microbial processes are in acting to break down the rocks and really form this soil surface that we see today. We will investigate whether fungi exist at depth. Here we're talking about 50 to 100 meters depth. Their role in weathering is to release important nutrients found in the minerals that other organisms need for their growth. We really have a lot of fragments, a lot of fractures, where weathering is happening and where hopefully we can expect to find bacteria and other microorganisms. Living organisms can also weather rocks. There are microorganisms in deep rock, in the deep biosphere. How do they get there? From the very top, the soil. Large numbers of bacteria and microscopic soil fungi live there. With flowing water, the microbes are transported through the fractures to depth. Down there, in complete darkness, the microbes live on water, in blue, carbon, in yellow, and energy. But where does the energy come from? A mineral with bivalent iron is immersed in water, dissolved oxygen, in red, carbon, and microbes. First, an oxygen atom hits the mineral. The divalent iron in the mineral is oxidized to trivalent iron. An iron oxide layer is formed. In the process, an electron passes from the mineral to the microbe. At the same time, the microbe absorbs carbon from the water. The microbe grows. It divides, and now there are two of them. This process is repeated many times. The iron-containing minerals are oxidized more and more, carbon is consumed, and more and more microbes are created. This is how the deep biosphere keeps itself alive and weathers the rock at the same time. Four suspects. But we still don't know which one is the true killer. So the rock samples are shipped to laboratories in Germany for further investigation. Samples are sterile packed for microbiological investigations. The one and a half meter long cores are stored in core boxes. Change of location. The drill cores from Chile are now stored in Potsdam. How do you proceed? How can you prove which suspect did it? We can't prove who did it. We can only hypothesize about who the suspects are and how the murder took place. But since the processes happened deep below the ground, we can't directly witness them. And that's why we can only falsify, meaning exclude, the hypothesis. I also work according to a process of elimination. Anyone who has a rock-solid alibi must be removed from circle of suspects. I'm the best detective in the world. Consequently, scientists are using modern laboratory and computer methods to try to eliminate the hypotheses formulated in Chile. First, it's all about fractures. A first step. The fractures found in the rocks and the data from the field have to be evaluated with computer methods. In the field in Chile, a probe was lowered into the borehole to collect data on the rock properties. What we see in the picture is so-called televiewer data. 
With the televiewer, we can make a borehole wall visible, so to speak. This produces an image of the fractures in our borehole. Here, these are very narrow fractures. Here are wider fractures. And at the end, we can see a three-dimensional image of the borehole wall with all the fractures, as they are aligned in the borehole. We now have an interior image of a borehole, but in a landscape, a hole is still just a single point. But we need to know what happened across the entirety of the landscape. Geophysical methods can help. They can explore the deep subsurface without the need to drill. As a first method, seismometers are installed along a path, small geophones that can sensitively sense seismic vibrations of the underground. This weight drop triggers the seismic vibrations. The tiny ground movements created by the weight are recorded by the geophones. Seismic waves are acoustic waves which travels in the subsurface and uh, when the seismic waves pass through different types of rocks, it will have different seismic velocities. In a sense that wetter rocks will have lower velocity and bedrock will have a higher seismic velocity. Another method is magnetotellurics. The geophysics team set up a large antenna that generates short magnetic fields to induce currents in the subsurface. These reveal the electrical conductivity of the rock. I'm a geophysicist. That means that I study the physical properties of the rocks and I correlate them with the geology or tectonical process. Um, I'm also specialized in electromagnetism, meaning that I use electromagnetic waves to study the subsurface. But the signals from the subsurface have to be made visible. To do this, elaborate computer analyses are performed by Chandy for his seismic vibration recordings and by Jose for his electrical current data. This involves sending a computer job to a mainframe computer to calculate models. After half a week, the results are back. What we have now here is the 2D subsurface images from the seismic, where the red color over here shows the wettered rocks, while the blue color shows the unwettered rocks. And we have a very good correlations with the borehole data. Now, we also have indications of fault structure going to the surface, which could provide pathways to enable deep weathering. We have defined the weather in front at about 20 meters depth, which we assume that the murder happens. <laughs> and I'm really, really happy that my results actually correlate with the seismic and with other methodologies inside the Deep Air Shape project. Two geophysical methods come to the same conclusion on the structure of the subsurface. This gives us much more confidence in our interpretation of our results. Next, it's not just about computer models, but about fractures in reality. We make the finest fractures in the rock visible. To do this, we first fill the cavities in the rock with a blue liquid. Then a very thin section is made from this sample and viewed under a microscope. What we can see nicely are larger fractures that cut through minerals, which is an indication that we see a tectonic fracture. And then we see that from these large tectonic fractures, a lot of small fractures branch out. Secondly, it is about water. We have seen fractures, so water could have flowed to depth. But does the water also enter the solid rock between the fractures? All that is coloured blue is indeed where water can move through. And what happens is that from the wide tectonic fractures, water penetrates into the rock along grain boundaries and, by dissolving minerals, helps form even more porosity in the rock. But this flow of water has taken place at depth over the thousands of years that the rock was beneath Earth's surface. Thus, we look for indirect evidence. Has water ever been there? How much? For how long? In the clean lab, sophisticated geochemical methods give us fingerprints for water flow. For example, a method based on the very rare cosmogenic radioisotope beryllium-10. 
This can only occur where rainwater has actually flowed through the rock. The sample is drawn into the machine here, then it evaporates, and at 6,000 degrees it is ionized. Then we can measure the concentrations of the various elements in the sample. In particular, we are talking about beryllium. With the beryllium that we measure in the sample, we can find out if water was present at that depth. So whether water has infiltrated from the surface into the soil and made it down to the depth of the sample. Now the puzzle is coming together. The isotope beryllium-10 shows that large amounts of rainwater did indeed flow through the blue-colored sections in the thin section. Third, it is about reagents. Some reagents we can measure directly. For example, organic carbon in soil and weathered rock. Or we measure changes in the chemical composition of rocks and their isotopes as a result of reactions. This requires sophisticated geochemical laboratory techniques. We identify how strongly the reagents have acted and at what depth. Finally, we can use the electron microscope. Here we can see with micrometer precision how reagents have dissolved a mineral. We find that all the rocks are weathered down to a depth of at least 20 meters. Here is the crime scene where they were murdered. Some were weathered even at a depth of 77 meters. The question remains about the role of microbes. They are so small and so rare in the deep rocks that they can be reliably detected only by microbiological laboratory methods. There are three questions to answer. Who is there? Using solvents, Tiny amounts of DNA from the cells are extracted from the rock powder. By sequencing the DNA, we learn which types of microbes are present in the rock. How many are there? Using the qPCR method, the DNA of selected microbes is amplified and their abundance is quantified. What are they doing there? In a growth experiment, the microbes are multiplied in the laboratory. For example, if you suspect that the bacteria oxidize iron, you add iron to the nutrient solution. A clearly visible colony of bacteria then develops. Our microbiologists evaluate this information. At what depth do we find these cells, and what types of microbes are they? Is there any certain uh, bacteria live in the deeper depths? Uh, we can say that there are definitely microbes living at 77 meter depth. Okay. Do you think what, uh, what do they live off? Um, it looks like they live off uh, organic carbon and um, yeah. also uh, oxygen. Uh, do you have any iron oxidating bacteria there? Yeah, we can find some, uh, a few um, iron oxidating bacteria which uh, are present in the rare biosphere. Do you think uh, the bacteria eat rock? Yeah, kind of. I think okay. they do. It turns out that none of the suspects have an alibi and we cannot prove that any of them had a role committing the murder. Therefore, our new hypothesis is that all the processes work together. Everything interacts. When investigating the murder on the Orient Express, I concluded who among them is the murderer, who reaches for the knife. The answer is not one of them would have been able to do it, not even two. There was only one way. They all had to do it, united. And so it is done. And what does that mean in our case? In our case, because the rocks move towards the surface of the Earth, they come out of physical and chemical equilibrium. The actors react, a new life is created. During weathering of the deep rocks, all the actors act together. This is a property characteristic of the entire Earth system, in which all actors are constantly interacting. A fracture opens up, through which water immediately flows. The water carries carbon and reagents with it from above. New minerals are formed and in the process open up further fractures. The large fractures are also a gateway for microbes from above. 
They multiply at depths where there is carbon and iron is oxidized. All of nature's actors are constantly interacting, under and on the earth. And in the process, soil is created. Is happening in Chile? Mais oui, but you are standing on a crime scene. The good thing is, when rocks weather, they turn into soil, and the plants grow on it, and we live on it. <laughs> 